One of the things that many British people are proudest of in Britain is the so-called stately homes that dot the countryside, mansions, palaces, and castles of the gentry and aristocracy of the past, uh, principally from the 16th to the early 20th century. These houses are very grand. Many of them have hundreds of rooms, uh, lots of history, fabulous collections, including very high-end art, and amazing gardens in particular. But they also have some astonishingly racy stories uh, associated with them. In fact, the stately homes are a wonderful font of stories about sexuality and gender. Because the upper classes of Imperial Britain, like privileged people at all times, felt that they were freer than other people, that they could disobey the laws and social rules about uh, sexuality and gender, at least to some extent. Consequently, they have left us a, a lot of information about their sexuality and gender, much more than regular people. There will also be some other themes as we go through these houses. In, in particular, there's a lot of literature associated with them. We will refer to the novels Brideshead Revisited and Orlando, which, like much of this literature, have become uh, movies or TV series. In this episode, we will move from north to south and from modest to unbelievably grand, starting with Shipton Hall. Shipton is a relatively modest stately home in the north of England near York. It was a Jacobean house that stayed in a family called Lister for about 300 years, from the 17th through the early 20th century. It's mostly of interest to us, however, because of one member of the Lister family, a woman called Anne Lister, who lived in the early 19th century and is known today because of the TV show about her, Gentleman Jack. Just as she is represented in the TV show, Lister was both gender nonconforming and a lesbian. She dressed all in black and didn't wear petticoats, and she also conducted herself in what for her time was seen as a masculine manner. Uh, for instance, she handled her own investments, uh, and she had investments in unfeminine things like canals and railroads, and she opened coal mines on her property. And she is one of the first people in history whom we can call not merely a woman who had some erotic relations with another woman or other women, but a lesbian. That is, a woman who was consistently and exclusively attracted to other women, because we know a lot about her sexuality. How do we know? Anne Lister wrote diaries. She started her diaries when she was 13 and wrote them right through her life. She wrote 27 volumes containing over 5 million words, and a large part of that is about her sexual and romantic life. These parts were in code, a code that Lister and her first lover, Eliza Rain, devised when they were at boarding school together, comprised of ancient Greek letters, zodiac symbols, punctuation marks, and mathematical symbols. The code was not complex by coding standards. Uh, it involved simple symbol for letter substitutions, uh, and it has been decoded several times, uh, first by a descendant of hers who discovered the diaries behind a panel in Shipton Hall in the early 20th century, but who put them back in their hiding place when he discovered what they contained. More recently, it has been decoded and uh, published by women study scholars at Birmingham University. What the diaries reveal is a heated lesbian sex life uh, involving affairs with a number of different women, uh, we learn about how she seduced other women, um, or rather how they seduced each other, about her orgasms, and even her speculations about why she was a lesbian. Ultimately, Lister settled down with a local heiress called Anne Walker. They exchanged rings and took communion together at Holy Trinity Church in York. And this is generally seen today as the earliest lesbian marriage in England, or, or perhaps even the whole modern West. Our next house is... Mattersfield Court is way to the south of Shipton in the western part of the Midlands and a much grander house with things like a moat and a private chapel. As with Shipton, much of what you see is 19th century, but Mattersfield has in fact passed down exclusively by inheritance since the 12th century and been owned by people called Ligon since the 1450s. Again, as with Shipton, the house is famous because of someone's writing. In this case, 
not the diaries of an owner, but a novel by a frequent visitor, the novelist Evelyn Waugh. Waugh spent so much of his time at Mattersfield with the Lincolns in the 1930s that he wrote two novels there, but it is Brideshead Revisited that is about, or inspired by, his relationship with the family. You may remember Brideshead from the 1981 TV series starring Jeremy Irons. The series was filmed at an even grander house, Castle Howard in Yorkshire, but the story, or the backstory, took place here at Mattersfield, or Matters, as the bright young things of the 1930s called it. The novel, or TV series, is about a young painter who goes up a kind of platonic ladder of love to Catholicism. He starts by having a crush on a glamorously self-destructive friend at Oxford named Sebastian Flight, and eventually falls in love with his family and their family home. Later, when Sebastian has met his alcoholic doom, he uh, transfers his love to a sister who looks like Sebastian. The author Waugh became very close friends with the Ligon sisters rather than marrying one, but the general sweep of the story reflects his relationship with the Ligons. He had a crush and on, and probably an affair with, uh, Hugh Ligon at Oxford, spent time at matters with his family, and stuck with them after scandal engulfed the family. Sebastian Flight and his story is quite close to Hugh Lickin's life, and to his death, which was probably caused by his alcoholism, itself probably a response to conflict about his sexuality, which seems to have been more exclusively homosexual than was. But interestingly, the family scandal was not about that. The scandal was about not Hugh, but his father, who was also gay, a fact which Waugh omits in the novel. William Lickin, Lord Beecham was a very prominent man. He was the liberal leader in the House of Lords and held important roles in the royal household and even in the cabinet. At one point, he was the governor of Queensland in Australia. Considering his background, though, he was quite a progressive. He was very concerned with limiting hours for minors and improving safety standards and so on. He was also a wonderful father. He had seven children, all of whom, except the youngest, who was too young to be really involved, stood by him during the scandal. Indeed, six of his children were entirely on their father's side in the divorce. But the scandal, as I said, was all about his homosexuality. Lord Beecham, although since he had seven children, he clearly had had sex with a woman, was certainly what today we would call gay. He had many well-known, but hush-hush, affairs with other aristocrats, servants, even his son's friends when they were home from Oxford. There are many pretty wild stories about him. Probably my favorite is that at a dinner party, once a guest overheard him whispering to the butler, a long time lover of his, je t'adore in French. Uh, but uh, when the guest turned to his neighbor, Harold Nicholson, who will turn up in our next uh, story and asked him, what he had just heard uh, Beecham say, Nicholson covered for him and said, nonsense. He said, shut the door. Anyway, this all ended very badly for Lincoln because his brother-in-law, Hugh Grosvenor, the Duke of Westminster, a spoiled, sour, aging playboy and the lover of, of Coco Chanel, decided that he wasn't having any more of his brother-in-law behaving like this and denounced him to the king. The king was shocked. His lack of sympathy can easily be seen from his first reaction. I thought men like that shot themselves. Uh, but above all, he wanted the scandal hushed up. Uh, Beecham was a prominent aristocrat, but also one of the king's sons was in the habit of visiting matters, supposedly having an affair with one of the daughters. But who knows? Anyway, the king sent a delegation of aristocrats to convince Lincoln to resign his offices and go into exile, uh, which he did, uh, upon which his triumphant brother-in-law sent him um, a note saying, Dear bugger-in-law, you got what you deserved. <laughs> Lovely, eh? <laughs> anyway, let's turn now to Harold Nicholson, um, Ligon's ally, and go all the way to the south of England and to one of the grandest stately homes, Knoll. A very large and quite well-preserved Elizabethan and Jacobean house. Knoll served as a cardinal's palace and a royal palace, 
in particular for Queen Mary uh, I, who lived there while her father, Henry VIII, was divorcing her mother, his first queen, Catherine of Aragon. Before, it was given to Thomas Sackville, in whose family it has stayed until today, although a large part of it is now open to the public. Knoll itself could occupy a video. Just to give you an idea, it is said that the house reflects the calendar, with 365 rooms, 52 staircases, 12 entrances, and 7 courtyards. We are looking at Knoll, however, not because of itself, but because of a woman who had a complex gender and sexual identity and acted it out to an astonishing degree. Her name is Vita Sackville West, and she was a very popular author in Britain in the 1920s and 30s. Nowadays, she is known mainly because she had a long love affair, or a long friendship starting with a love affair, with Virginia Woolf. This, in turn, is famous because Woolf wrote her most accessible novel, Orlando, about Sackville West. The novel, in which Noel plays an important role, portrays Sackville West as a kind of eternal character who lives through centuries, embodying several of her ancestors, male and female, because Orlando changes sexes during the novel, starting out as a man and ending up as a woman. Sackville West's son, Nigel Nicholson, referred to Orlando as, quote, the longest and most charming love letter in history, end quote. But uh, it also perhaps served as a consolation for Sackville West's greatest personal grief. Uh, because her family practiced primogeniture, i.e. the family estate passed down to the eldest male heir, she uh, could not inherit her beloved stately home with all of its ancestral memories. Wolf and Sackville West were very important to each other, as you can see in Sackville West's study, which was preserved as a museum after her death, where photos of her two most abiding loves, her husband and Wolf, sit on opposite sides of her desk. For Wolf, Sackville West was the first, and perhaps only, person with whom she enjoyed sex, and the first to whom she told about her childhood story of sexual abuse. But after three years, Wolf broke off their sexual relationship, at least in large part because of Sackville West's other affairs. Indeed, Sackville West had many affairs, some with men, but most, or at least the main ones, with women. Probably the other most important one was with Violet Trefusis, uh, the daughter of King Edward VII's mistress, Alice Keppel, with whom she carried on an intense affair from when they were in school together until after both of their marriages. In fact, after their marriages, to men, in case that isn't clear, they eloped together to France several times, where Sackville West would dress as a man and Squire Trefusis about. Just to give you an idea of how over-the-top their behavior was, Trefusis swore that she would never sleep with her husband, and Sackville West broke off the affair when she discovered that Trefusis had, or might have, broken her oath. Anyway, in the midst of all her many affairs with women, Vita got married to Harold Nicholson, and she and Nicholson purchased another stately home not too far away from Knoll, a ruined castle called Sissinghurst, where they raised their two sons and created one of the great modern gardens. It doesn't follow the styles that we see in earlier stately homes. Instead, it's, it's much more private. The garden is designed as a series of outdoor rooms, closed off by hedges and walls, each with a certain amount of privacy. The most famous is the White Garden, which we're showing you here, composed entirely of white and off-white flowers. Vida and Harold lived in different parts of the restored ruins, Vida in the tower, which we looked at when we looked at her study. In fact, Harold and Vida's marriage and the garden that in a sense embodied it is one of the most interesting things about her. She had many affairs and Harold tended to have affairs with men, but they were also deeply attached to each other and their marriage. In fact, after Vida's death in the 1960s, her son Nigel found in her study a kind of memoir that she had written about her sex life, and he published it, along with other material from her letters and so on, in a book called Portrait of a Marriage, in which he talked about his parents' open marriage. Nicholson and Sackville West were less bohemian than the Bloomsbury set, but their sex lives were just as unconventional. Anyway, that's enough scandals and books about them from Stately Homes for today. We'll bring back some more another time 
but only after some other videos, starting with our next about royal mistresses who co-ruled their countries.